Hello, welcome to the video. Today, I'm going to be speaking about ranges. Ranges in poker, how they operate, how much we should follow them, how important they are. The first question that you should ask yourself is, when I'm playing poker, should I follow a range? And the answer is no, but also yes. So it's quite a complicated question. And for one, because there are many different types of ranges and many different contexts in which we play poker. So you could be playing cash games, you could be playing with antis, you could be playing without antis. You could be playing against opponents who are better than you, you could be playing against opponents who are much worse than you. You could be playing against opponents that have very obvious tendencies or opponents that don't. For example, if you're playing against people who are playing much more passive than they are supposed to be or much more aggressive than they're supposed to be, this is gonna change the way you should build your range. As a beginner player, when you don't know what hands you are supposed to be playing, ranges are the best place to start. Let's start by looking at a range. Okay, so here's an example of a range. This is a six max opening under the gun range. So this is no antis and it also accounts for rake, meaning because there's no rake taken from pots before the flop, you are more incentivized to play more aggressively before the flop and win the hand pre-flop. I never have any rake when you win the hand. If you're a new player, you might not know which hands to play and how to play them from which situation at all. So you might be raising with ace eight offsuit under the gun, you might be limping under the gun with queen eight suited, you might not be raising king 10 suited. And for a player like that, the range is absolutely perfect because it tells you exactly which hands you can play and it gives you a really good idea of how you can play them. This is gonna massively increase your win rate straight away because you're just playing hands that can make money. When you're looking at a range, this is a sold range and ranges can only be solved against ranges. So this is a range that has been solved against the computer playing against itself, meaning it's trying to find the best range to beat itself, it's calibrating, and this is the equilibrium, however the person has solved, which also accounts for bet size. So, for example, in this in this sold range, under the gun opens to either two or 2.2 big blinds, but if you want to open to 2.5 big blinds, or if you want to open to three big blinds, that's going to change the range as well. Also, how your opponents are responding to you. And this is a range because everyone on the table in this six max game is free betting perfectly. They're free betting exactly the right amount from every seat. They're calling the exact right amount from every seat. And in reality, we know that this is not the case. No one plays perfect poker. So already we can see that by playing this perfect range, it is unexploitable. Well, that's the key word here, but it is not exploitative. We are not exploiting anyone by playing this range necessarily. We are still making money from people who, who make mistakes in some situations. So for example, if you follow a range and it tells you to free bet a certain hand a certain percentage of the time and your opponent is going to respond to that free bet by calling with too many hands or by folding too many hands you're going to gain ev already based on the fact that they're not playing the perfect solved range but we also know the game is not that simple the game is not as simple as what happens pre-flop some people might make better decisions than you post-flop and get that edge back or some people might make worse decisions than you post-flop and then lose even more ev so how we calibrate to our opponents completely depends on everything about how they play in terms of if we want to play perfect poker to maximize our EV against that player, if that makes sense. Let's start by just looking at this range and see what we think. Straight away, I can see when I'm under the gun in a six max cash game with no antis. Yeah, I always want to raise with pocket sixes to aces. I always want to raise with ace 10 off, king jack off, ace free suited. But you can see the way, the way this range is composed that you can see which hands kind of correlate to which hands. So for example here, Jack-9 suited is about as valuable as 9-8 suited, all the way down to 5-4 suited. Whereas some people might think that 5-4 suited has as much value as a hand like King-9 suited. Um, pocket twos and pocket threes also have this same value, playing them about 25% of the time. Pocket fours about half the time, and then your pocket fives is folded sometimes, same with your 10-9 ten, ten suited, yeah. Um, your King-10 off and your Queen-Jack off are, are also this 25% value. Your Ace-2 suited isn't always a raise. Your King-8 suited isn't always a raise. And then even hands like King-5 suited might be a raise sometimes. So immediately by looking at this, you might think, oh, I'm, I don't raise with King-5 suited in this position. Am I, am I playing too tight? Or I always raise with um, Queen-Jack off suit here. Am I playing too loose? And you can already start to kind of learn stuff about your game, whether you are potentially being exploitative in your strategy in this situation. And if you are, that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Because, for example, if, like we talked about before, if your opponents are not responding correctly, then you can gain even more EV by doing this. If you expand your open range against players who are playing too passive, you're going to make even more EV because they're not going to free bet you as much, meaning you fall pre, and they're not going to defend as much, and they're not going to check raise the flop as much, and all these other factors. So 
you have to kind of take this with a pinch of salt. Uh, also, every solve has slight different metrics. Some people use solvers um, and when they input all the strategies of all the other players, they're gonna have slightly different options like free bet sizes and like options to call, options to dunk, to, to lead on the flop, or options to check raise to different sizes. And that's also gonna have a massive knock on effect on the entire strategy. So ranges are, if anything, the perfect starting point to your strategy. And they're also the entry point to your strategy. So for a new player, it's really important to, to thoroughly get the fundamentals down with poker and to know this is a hand that I just cannot play because it, you can't make money with this hand. It's important to have this as your foundation for your strategy because if you start by playing too many hands, you're just gonna, you're not gonna know how to build your strategy going forward. The more hands you play now, the more it's gonna have a knock-on effect to, to cause a worse strategy later on and you're gonna be more exploitable. So for example, if you start raising every time with Queen Jack offsuit here, when I'm defending the big blind against you, and I know you're always working with Queen Jack offsuit, I get to then attack you more on flops because Queen Jack offsuit is a hand that is usually quite weak. So on, on boards where Queen Jack is not the nuts and on boards where it's Queen or Jack high and you're gonna end up folding with your top pairs by the rope, there's a potential exploit there where someone playing aggressively against you post flop can make more EV. But having said that, most people do not play too aggressively post flop. Okay, so now we've seen this range. This is a range without antis. This is a range where it's only six players at the table. So you think this is gonna be, if anything, one of the tightest ranges which makes sense. So let, let's think about which, which hands are here uh, and which hands that are always a play, which hands are a play sometimes. Like maybe you were opening always King-10, maybe you were never opening King-Jack King, King Jack, and you can kind of kind of uh, calibrate your strategy to this to see where you're at. Let's see uh, MTT range for under the gun. This range is tighter in some places and looser in some places. And now it always raises with Ace-2 suited. It always, it doesn't always play Ace-6 suited. It doesn't play these other suited kings. Um, it has 10-8 suited in its range sometimes. It kind of plays similarly with the suited connectors, similarly with pocket fives, but it never plays the smaller pairs. And it never plays these king-10 uh, king ten offsuit hands. It plays less king-jack offsuits. Uh, so th this range is a little bit different, and that's because there's an ante. That's a reason to expand your range. It's under the gun in a four-ring game, so this is nine-handed, which means there's more players to act. There's more people that can free bet you, more people that can respond. So that's gonna make you play a bit tighter. The ante's gonna make you play a little bit wider. And you're still 100 big blinds deep here. It's important to understand how your range shifts based on the factors. Are you a cash game? Is there antes? Which position are you at the table? How many players are, are to act? And we can still see like most of the same hands are, that are always players are always there. But now we, like I've got an idea that A6 suited and A2 suited, like that. For some reason, this can be interchangeable. And like these suited kings may go down in value pretty quick. The small pairs go down in value pretty quick. 10-8 suited starts to get in there. But yeah, like this this is gonna give you an idea again of which hands might, might be plays. Now let's have a look at a low jack opening range for tournaments. So here, this range is gonna be much wider. So this is a uh, low jack, which would be the same as six max under the gun because there's five players to act afterwards, but this is with antis. So it's a tournament low jack range. And here you can see the range is suddenly a lot wider. So twos becomes almost always a raise. Your suited connectors still aren't always a raise, which I think a lot of people make the mistake of always playing them. Not to say that's always a mistake based on what I said before. Your jack 10 offsuit is now in here. Ace nine is starting to creep in there. Queen eight suited, jack eight suited, and always 10 eight suited, some nine seven suited. Some uh, the king six and king seven suited are always in there. So you can see the range starts to expand and you can see how it expands as well. So which hands get included first? For example, your 10 eight suited is more valuable than your ace nine off in this case because we're 100 big blinds deep. And your pocket freeze is more valuable than your king five suited. So this is a lot to do with the stack depth. And this is gonna be another thing that changes your range a lot. Uh, let's look at one more range, and this is 20 big blinds deep from the low jack. Let's see how it changes when we get a lot more shallow. So now suddenly your ace nine is always a raise. It wasn't really ever raising before. Ace eight offsuit raises sometimes, and your small pairs disappear, your suited connectors completely disappear. Ace two suited disappears. You, you have a little bit of limping, that's what this, this green is, um, if, if you want to. Jack 10 offsuit, queen 10 offsuit, they're a bit more. So it seems like the solver is starting to favor bigger cards at the shorter depths. And that that's because if you hit a pair, you're more likely to just get it in and be happy. Like you're, it's fine to hit flop top pair with Jack 10 and go broke at this stack depth. Whereas if you're 100 big steep, it's a lot worse because you might lose a big pot to a bigger top pair more often. But again, it's interesting to see how these ranges change. So here's another under the gun MTT tournament range, similar to the second range we looked at. It's also a, a little bit different. Like Ace 2 suited is the one not being used instead of Ace 6 suited. So it's almost like these hands can can swap based on how people solve it, which is to do with the sizes they input and what, whatever other calibrations they've made. It's sort of a similar story for the other hands, but like your pocket twos and pocket threes and pocket fours, uh, there are different percentages. Your your nine eight suited is a different percentage. And 
Like we've still got an idea that like all, all of these hands are always plays, but now like your ace ten offsuit has suddenly gone down a bit, which which I find quite interesting. So what have we learned by looking at these ranges? Well, for a start, they. I know some of these positions are different and the context is different, but it goes to show you that there is a lot of factors when it comes to, to making a range. Even sometimes when we look at the same ranges, so for example, with these two, these two ranges here are supposed to be in theory the same because they're both solved, they're both MTT, they're both with anties, they're both out of position dash under the gun. But you can see there is some small differences, like your, your two threes and fours are not here at all, but they're here sometimes. Uh, six five suited is his, okay. Your six five and seven six and eight seven suited look kind of similar. Uh, nine eight suited, this one plays more. Ten eight suited, it plays more. King eight suited, it plays more. But then ace two suited does not exist. Ace three suited isn't always there. Ace six suited is always there. Ace ten offsuit goes from pure to a little bit less. So the, both of these are sold ranges, which means in theory they're ranges you could follow, knowing that you're doing this unexploitable strategy, but. The thing with an unexploitable strategy is it's very complicated and it involves the flop and it involves the turn and it involves the river and it's it's quite intuitive that when you get into some situations in poker that it's not the strategy you should be playing. For example, when, when you get to a river and you go all in with a, a value bet and they call with a hand that is, you know, they're never supposed to call with, then it's clear in that situation that playing an exploitable, unexploitable strategy involving a balanced bluffing strategy on the river is, is bad because they're calling with hands they're not supposed to. There's many things which are going to solve the way you play your range. And it's going to be your opponent's tendencies, it's going to be your stack depth, it's going to be whether there's antis or not, it's going to be the general context of the game. So obviously if there is, if you're near the bubble in a tournament, if there's ICM because you're near a final table, this completely changes the way you play your range. But the problem people have with ranges or at least in my opinion, the problem that a lot of people have with ranges is that they will see them and they will follow them to the letter and that is just their strategy and they won't look at it again because they think this is a solved strategy, this is exactly how I should play my range and then they, they build their strategy on that to post flop. And this is very good to first learn how to play poker. So if you want to play Zoom Cash, you're always playing with the same people, you're just trying to get a big sample of hands, you just want to, you want to hone in a fundamental strategy which is these are the hands I play, I'm going to get into every situation with these hands. It's how you lay the foundation but this, this is not the best strategy to use against people. I remember solvers play against solvers, people play against people. If, if someone uses a randomizer pre-flop to open a 10A suited 80% of the time, whatever it is, to me, you're taking away your poker intuition. And if you play poker, you have this, whether you, you feel like you do or not, you just know by watching people play, by getting a feel for how people play, you can see which direction they are in certain situations. You can see this guy is never free betting bluffs. You, you can figure that out about some people pretty quickly. And obviously they're, like they're open to prove you wrong, but it can be true until it's not true. So ranges are great because they show you which hands you can play and which hands you can use, but it's, it's not the end picture. It's up to you to figure out how to calibrate that. So if I look at hand under the gun, so let's say I look at 10-8 suited under the gun in this situation, I'm not thinking I know a solver opens this uh, either 15% or 20 or 78%. I'm thinking, I know 10 8 suited is a hand that I can play. It's in some solved ranges. H how is, what is going on? Who is at my table? How are they playing? Am I at a table with nothing but absolute wizards and people who are playing like what seems to be very, very good poker all the time? Well, maybe I don't always open 10 8 suited. Am I playing against a table where there's a lot of fun players and a lot of people that are playing very passive and a lot of people making huge mistakes post flop? Well, then I always play 10 8 suited. And you can expand this based on your intuition. So what have we learned today? For a start, if you're a beginner player, following ranges to learn a strategy, I think is completely fine and a really good starting point. Two, I think it's really important to be aware of the context of your situation. So if you're playing online as opposed to live, if you're playing with the same opponents repeatedly or not, they can take notes on you, they can calibrate to your strategy, then it's really important to be aware of that. And that is how close to a range you should play. The more people can exploit you or will exploit you, the more you need to be a unexploitable. Also, if you're playing against people better than you, the more refined your range should be because good players will be able to exploit you more when they notice that you are playing more or less hands. And also remember that when you look at a range, it's been solved based on 
their bet sizes, their post-flop strategies, and whatever else is involved with their solves, and there's gonna be subtle changes. Don't think that your range is the only way. If someone plays a hand that's slightly different, that doesn't mean that it's wrong. And they could also be doing their version of calibration, like may maybe it is wrong, but not necessarily. Most importantly, never leave out your intuition. Never just think, I'm in like a live poker cash game, I'm gonna play my perfect opening range. It's more than likely that you're just missing out on a lot of value and the point in poker is to maximize value. So therefore, the more that you follow a strategy to the letter without making any changes based on your opponents, the less money and EV that you're going to make. And if you're playing against people who are better than you, this is a completely different story. And it's obviously sometimes very difficult to know who is a better player than you at the table. But in other cases, it can be very clear based on how people are playing. And the more you learn about poker and strategies in poker, it becomes much more clearer when people are making mistakes and how to exploit those mistakes. So ranges are an excellent tool to start learning that. If you see someone playing a hand that's way, way out of a range, then immediately you can know how to exploit that in the future. Pay attention to how your opponents are playing, pay attention to game flow, always maintain your presence in the game, keep using your intuition, start with ranges, but learn how to calibrate to your opponents. That's the most important part. That's all I wanted to talk about today. Like, comment, subscribe, and all the other good stuff. And thanks for watching. Now that's big brain.